our water about our water stewardship commitment uh, that was launched a few weeks ago, uh, and to share a little bit of our journey uh, and how we got there. So, uh, at a, at a high level, when we talk about Google sustainability at Google, we build technology that helps people do more for the planet. And there are three pillars where we do that. The first is accelerating carbon free and circular, really there to demonstrate that we can decouple business growth from carbon intensity and from our material use. The middle pillar here is to empower with technology. You know, technology is really Google's core competency. And so we want to ensure that we can uh, leverage that technology and our products and our solutions uh, to allow people to make better decisions. Uh, and then the last one here is benefit people and places. Um, this sounds very familiar uh, to the EDF rename recently. And, and for us, this is similarly where water lives, under benefiting people and places. So before I get into our corporate water stewardship commitment, I'd like to share a little bit more about our journey to get here because we have been engaging in water uh, for quite some time. So uh, in 2007, uh, one of our data centers in Georgia worked with the local water and sewer authority to uh, take up to 30% of, of that agency's uh, wastewater, treat it and use it for cooling in the data in the cooling towers of the data center. In 2015, in our Silicon Valley campus, um, We've, we've always been installing low flow fixtures as we move into a building, either, you know, an existing building that we take over and retrofit or in a new construction, low flow fixtures are, are an obvious and immediate uh, replacement. Uh, but another thing uh, that we have on our campus here is uh, laundry facilities, um, you know, washers and dryers for employees uh, to use. And so in these facilities, kind of like what you'd see in your apartment building, uh, and so one of the things that we tried was to pilot the Z-Nano laundry water recycling system and reuse system. So it would take, you know, the water coming out of the washing machine, filter it, and then cycle it back into the system to be used several times. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't really an easy one for us to scale, so it, it didn't go uh, too much past the pilot stage. Uh, but we also did a lot of conversions uh, of our um, fountains that were on campus and that we inherited as we moved into more buildings, uh, drained those, uh, took out the cement and really turned them into rain gardens with uh, some beautiful planting pallets. In 2016, we continued uh, to work on innovative cooling for our data centers. And a few more examples here in Belgium, we use industrial canal water for the cooling. Uh, our data center in Finland uses seawater for its cooling. And then in Dublin, Ireland, uh, it's air-cooled, no, no water for cooling. So that's uh, obviously a huge savings there. Uh, in 2016, coming back to our Silicon Valley campus, we created our first what we call Green Loop in Mountain View. And this is a pedestrian and bike path that uh, kind of goes around our campus uh, and allows for people to easily get from building to building on foot or on bike. Um, what's really nice about that is flanking the, the Green Loop on either side is a, a native adaptive pollinator friendly planting pallet that not only reduces our need for irrigation, um, but also uh, includes over 4,800 square feet of bioretention as a part of that to help reduce stormwater runoff and, uh, and address water quality. In 2017, we partnered with WRI, World Resources Institute, and did our first water risk assessment using their Aqueduct Risk Atlas. So this gave us a very high level uh, view of our entire global portfolio to understand where there was water risk and what type of water risk that was. So really helpful, especially when you have a large portfolio and a global and a diverse portfolio to understand where to focus and prioritize initiatives first. In 2019, uh, we partnered with the United Nations Environment Program and the European Commission's Joint Research Center to develop the Freshwater Ecosystems Explorer uh, and I'll share just a little bit more about that in a minute. In 2020, I'm happy to say uh, that we already saw some great presentations on Open ET. In 2020, we partnered, and you saw that we were part of that partnership, to create open evap evapotranspiration uh, and also a uh, new flood forecasting model that uses artificial intelligence to create much better predictions 
of localized flooding. Uh, this was um, first rolled out in India uh, and, and proved to be incredibly valuable and incredibly accurate at being able to, uh, to um, estimate that. In 2020, so we're getting very close to today, uh, we uh, achieved Alliance for Water Stewardship certification at our Mountain View, Los Angeles and Dublin campuses. Uh, which for me, you know, we've been doing so much work already. It was really wonderful to have this third party framework to bring all of this work under a common umbrella uh, and, and, you know, really um, uh, uh, bring a little bit more structure and clarity to all of that. Uh, and then in 2021, we're getting in again to today, we uh, invested in some of our first replenished projects and I'll share a bit more about uh, replenished projects uh, in a little bit. Uh, but this one example is working with the Colorado River Indian tribes to conserve water at Lake Mead, obviously a big, <laughs> big need right now. Um, and this was a, a, a joint effort and a joint funding effort um, that, that many, many private parties and others uh, invested in and will save uh, about 49 billion gallons of water over time and a $38 million investment. So coming to Google's commitment to water stewardship. Um, th this is it, this is the commitment and these are the three pillars associated with it. So our commitment is to replenish 100, to replenish 120% on average, more water than we consume by 2030 and to support water security and ecosystems in the communities we operate. That 120% on average, you may say, how did you get there? Um, basically, you know, we assigned uh, a, a draft rate of 40% to, to a watershed. If more than 40% of the water is being withdrawn from that watershed, then we consider it overdrafted. And so how far overdrafted is that? And, and what we're seeing here through our um, analysis is that in the, in the watersheds that we operate, the extremely high water scarce watersheds um, would need about 155% replenishment. So we will go, uh, beyond our consumption by 100 uh, by 55 percent and replenish that much more water in the high water scarce watersheds it's about 33 percent more and in the medium high scarce watersheds it'll it'll be a hundred percent so that's how when you look at our portfolio and where we have extreme uh extremely high high and medium high water scarcity it averages out to about 120 percent and then these are the three pillars for our strategy Advancing responsible water use at Google. This is really in our fence line, you know, our operations, our facilities, continuing the great work we've been doing, scale it, do more. Uh, the middle one there is benefit watersheds and communities. And that's where this replenish and watershed health projects come into play. And then the third one there, support water security with technology. Again, Google being a technology company, um, we've already embarked on this with some of the examples I've shared. And hopefully now that we have this corporate-wide strategy, uh, it'll give us the backing to do even more or for folks who have existing products and tools to start to think about how could they incorporate water stewardship uh, into their tools, products, et cetera. So sharing a little bit more, you know, supporting water security with technology. Uh, as I mentioned, we've already done some of that and hopefully there'll be more in the future, but here are a couple uh, of examples. I had mentioned before uh, the Global Surface Water Explorer. Uh, and, you know, if you get your hands on this presentation, they're all linked here so you can go check it out. But just Google Global Surface Water Explorer and you will find it. I imagine that many of you on this call would really enjoy just playing with the tool. It, it is there to help make good decisions, but it's fun to just play with and go see how water, surface water has changed over the years, how it changes seasonally, uh, and just to see that, especially if you're very familiar with a specific location. Uh, and then the flood forecasting. This is just a, a little animation uh, that shows some of the output of it. But basically, you know, using artificial intelligence, machine learning to create better predictions for flood forecasting. And obviously, with better predictions, you can better plan for it uh, and make sure that, you know, people, infrastructure, whatever it is, gets out of the way, gets to safety uh, ahead of the, the storm surges. There's a couple links at the bottom here that are either um, relevant or tangentially relevant here. Your plan, your planet is a, a consumer facing tool to help help uh, individuals make better decisions about how they operate in their home. Uh, water being one of those um, categories. Global Fishing Watch is another tool um, that, that came out of Google that allows 
um, uh, folks who, who manage uh, fishing stocks in the sea, in the ocean, uh, to track boats and uh, uh, hopefully reduce the amount of illegal fishing that happens. Uh, and then Environmental Insights Explorer is a tool uh, meant for uh, city planners and city operators to better understand the, the opportunities for carbon reduction uh, within their city. And, and I could imagine a world where, you know, maybe water starts to come into that tool as well. Uh, I would be really excited to, to see something like that. Uh, now, getting into advancing responsible water use at Google. Um, here, I just wanted to throw out some examples here. I know, you know, text is not the prettiest, but, you know, over the years, we've been doing all of these things, landscape conversions, connecting to municipal supply, recycled water supplies, whenever possible. We're very fortunate that in Mountain View and Sunnyvale, uh, where a lot of our operations are, we have the opportunity to connect to those recycled water systems. So we do that whenever it's possible. Uh, we'll also um, capture air conditioning, air conditioning condensate uh, as a way to um, reduce our potable water use for irrigation. So that will that condensate will supplement our irrigation needs. Uh, the Alliance for Water Stewardship certification that's been mentioned a couple times already in Los Angeles at the uh, the Playa Vista campus, which is the uh, the old hangar for the Howard Hughes Spruce Goose. Um, we moved into into that um, facility, which is a very cool one. Uh, we converted the cooling tower there to 100% recycled water uh, supplied by Los Angeles Department of Power and Water. And we uh, won an award from them last year, Customer of the Year Award, for being the first commercial customer to make that switch. And we haven't had any issues with that recycled water since. It's needed a, a little bit more filtration before it went into our cooling towers. Other than that, we've been good. Rainwater collection uh, for toilet flushing, we do that in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, in our cafes, food is a big part of, of Google's culture. Um, unfortunately, not right now, as most of us are working from home. Uh, but implementing best practices there. And one of those, especially pertinent to water, is water-free thawing, making sure that we don't keep the tap running under a frozen piece of, of food in order to thaw it. Doesn't make sense. All you need to do is better plan. Uh, elimination of single-use still bottled water, which some people ask, how is that water stewardship? Well, it, it makes us um, rely on our local water sources more and make sure that everyone is well-educated on the, the quality of water that's coming to our site and the, the value of, um, of, of, of using that system versus bottled waters. COVID threw a wrench in this, as you could imagine, um, but you know, hopefully coming out of COVID, we, we will um, uh, double down on, on that commitment. Collaborating on creek and levee improvements uh, in, in, the, in the Bay and uh, employee education on the local water systems, making sure that all employees are aware of where our water comes from. Um, how it gets to Google, where it goes after it leaves our campus, and how they can participate in being good water stewards, both in work and at home. Uh, so in, in this, you know, advancing responsible water use at Google, I did want to highlight one project here, which is our new development called Bayview. This is located on Moffett Federal Airfield. Uh, it's about 1.2 or 3 million square feet, and it will have uh, on-site treatment of all of its wastewater, and then obviously reuse that water on site as well. What we show here is a, a, a description of the demands in a typical commercial building and how those demands could be met from potable and non-potable supplies. So on the left, you see our demands for cooling, primarily cooling towers, irrigation, uh, toilets and, and urinal flushing, and then below that line is all of our potable needs, sinks, showers, laundry, the water that we're consuming. Uh, and so that first, uh, that second bar there, you know, in a conventional building in this location where we're very lucky to have uh, a recycled water network, this is probably what the conventional uh, building would look like. Some recycled water, predominantly probably for the, the toilet flood, or no, for the irrigation, uh, and then the rest supplied by potable water. If you get to a, a LEED Platinum building, you know, LEED being a, a green building rating system and Platinum being their highest rating that you could get, uh, you'll start to see more recycled water used. Maybe there's dual plumbing, maybe for some of the cooling, uh, and then also capturing some of the storm water and rain water, but still needing city potable water to, to make up the rest of those non-potable uses. Uh, and then where, where we're aiming for this building is to go for the Living Building Challenge Net Positive Water uh, pedal certification and, and here, this is where we get an on-site water treatment system. 
we capture all of the stormwater and rainwater on the site uh, and, and we blend it together in the system to then be distributed to all of the non-potable uses. And we still will have a potable city connection, of course, for our, our potable needs. There is not enough rainwater to supply all of our um, all of our potable needs. And, and even if there was that, um, that's, a, that's another tricky question. <laughs> so what's exciting about this too is with the on-site treatment uh, that there's the ability to then export some of that non-potable water to the neighbors if and when that um, that becomes an option. One of the ways that this particular site was able to meet all of its non-potable demands from recycled water, rainwater, and stormwater was by being very innovative on our HVAC system. Uh, instead of a traditional system that relies on chillers, boilers, and cooling towers, uh, we implemented a ground source heat pump system here. And we did it in what I, well, I'm not taking credit for this. It was a very clever uh, a solution here. This building required structural piles, right? To drill into the ground, get the piles in there, and that's the footing for the building. Why not double duty those piles and use them as the cooling loop for the ground source heat pump? And that's exactly what happened here. So what you see is those piles that have been um, uh, drilled out and then on the left, you see the, um, the, the, the uh, cooling loops. So those are being placed down into the piles uh, where the cooling loop will run through that. So any energy, any heat can be absorbed or transmitted into that ground before it goes into the heat pump and then distributes out to the building. Uh, this, was a, this created a 60% reduction in energy demand and a 90% reduction in water demand, about 5 million gallons a year reduction maybe more than 90%. Our hope and our desire is that we don't actually need to use our cooling towers. There are cooling towers there, um, but they're really there for the design heat days. Global warming, climate change, maybe we will end up using it, um, but, but, but hopefully not. Uh, this is a, a, a diagram to show our uh, treatment and blending system. So we've got the potable supply coming in that supports our potable systems uh, that, you know, after that, it goes into the um, wastewater treatment lines to the on-site treatment where it gets treated and then into a blending system. Rainwater and stormwater from the sites are gonna be stored in uh, ponds on-site that will double down as uh, extra habitat because this is right on the bay's edge. Uh, and then they will eventually go, in, go into the blending system as well. So we'll mix rainwater, stormwater, and the on-site treated water um, together uh, to then serve the building's non-potable uses. That's the end of uh, the responsible water use at Google portion, now getting into benefit watersheds and communities. So again, this is that replenish watershed health projects off of our site that will benefit the watersheds that either supply our campuses or the watersheds that we are sitting in. And here in the Bay Area, I think all, everyone on this call understands that they're different here, <laughs> a different supply watershed than, than the local watershed we're sitting in. And, and so when we look at these offsite projects, we're, we're taking two approaches. Uh, the first one is to look for replenish projects. And these are volume first, really looking for projects that uh, bring a volume of water or make available a volume of water that otherwise would have been lost from the watershed. Uh, examples of these types of projects are listed here, like wetland restoration, harvesting of, uh, of alternative sources, even you know, forest management can, can play a big role here. The other type of project is watershed health projects, and, and these are kind of volume second. These projects are, are looking to address other issues in the watershed, whether that be uh, water quality, uh, ecosystem health, uh, water access, sanitation, and hygiene uh, for all those, uh, for everyone. Um, you know, and so th those types of projects can be habitat improvement, agricultural best, manage best management practices, true wash projects that bring fresh water to people who never had access before. Um, but really, these, these are on a continuum. These are on two sides of the continuum. Um, a replenished project is likely going to have other watershed health benefits, and we really want to look for those multiple benefits. And a watershed health project may have a volumetric component to it. Um, but it's, that's probably not the driver of the project. 
These are some of the projects that we have already invested in. Uh, I talked about the Colorado River Indian Tribes uh, that's in Arizona and really supports Lake Mead. Uh, it's predominantly around irrigation infrastructure modern modernization. Uh, another project uh, is the uh, down in Southern California in the San Gabriel Mountains, working with the National Forest Foundation to remove invasive species, in this case, tamarisk, which is an, an invasive and very thirsty species. So removing that uh, and, and restoring uh, native species to there. And basically the volume component is the difference in evapotranspiration rates of this invasive species versus the native species. Um, closer to the Bay Area, uh, down in um, the Gilroy area, uh, we funded the Spreckles Wetland Cleanup and Enhancement Project. It's going to uh, improve a, a wetland and um, raise a culvert there to allow for more storage. Um, another one down in that area is Fisher Creek, where we're uh, doing a riparian restoration project uh, to make sure we can, you know, fence it off from grazing uh, and then also um, rehab the, the channel a bit. Uh, in Dublin, Ireland, where they have a combined sewer system that is already at capacity. And so anytime it rains in Dublin, there's combined sewer overages and it rains often in Dublin. <clears throat> so the project that we've uh, funded uh, there is to capture the rainwater from residential rooftops and put them into planter boxes down at ground level. And the idea here is that some of that water will be sucked up by the plants and evaporated out. Some will be absorbed into the soil. Uh, and the rest will just be attenuated and held back a little bit to give that uh, treatment plant a little bit more time and a little breathing room to treat the rest of that storm water combined sewer, dis you know, as, as it comes into the plant and reduce the amount of combined sewer discharges. Uh, and then the last one here I am very excited about, uh, th this is one that, that came to us through the California Water Action Collaborative, QUAC, which is a group of NGOs and private companies coming together to find projects like this and, and fund them. And so this is one of them. And it's uh, down in Los Angeles installing automated toilet leak detection at managed low income housing. Uh, and the key part of this is managed housing, where there is someone who is a building manager that is hired uh, and responsible for uh, you know, maintaining the building and addressing these leaks when they come up versus you know, a personal residence where Maybe I'll get to it today. Maybe I'll get to it in two years. Who knows? So this is a, a, a leak detection system that alerts the, the property management that there is a leak so that they can go in and fix it. Uh, and obviously this has um, great improvements on reducing our potable water demand so that there's more water um, for other uses. And that's it. Thanks everyone for your time. Uh, happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Um, we do have uh, uh, some questions uh, from Tom Francis. Um, and uh, so he mentions the challenge challenge we face in the here in the Bay Area is that during normal and wet years, although I'm not sure what uh, normal is anymore or and I fantasize about wet, but anyway, during normal and wet years, we have reliable and ample water supply. During droughts, which could be more extensive in years to come, we see shortfalls. Your building plan assumes that you'll receive a source from rainfall and stormwater. Um, it says, which is unlikely, meaning that your bar chart would change based on year type. Is that being factored into your plans? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, yeah, rain, stormwater is variable. Um, and, and so obviously, you know, the, the system will, will have to, um, will have to work with what we have. I didn't talk about it, but in the diagram uh, that showed the blending system, there is a potable connection to that blending system. Hopefully we don't ever have to use it. Hopefully we don't pour potable water into our recycled water just so that we can um, use that for our toilet flushing. But in the scenario that you're alluding to, where maybe there is no rainwater, um, perhaps our wastewater is not enough to then meet those needs. I um, mean, in which case we would either have to turn down services, which is entirely plausible, um, or tap into that potable supply. Um, and uh, there's a second question, um, same author. Um, 
the Bay Area watersheds from a water supply perspective are located in this. Well, OK, so this is a different definition of watersheds. There's quotes around it. Uh, but from a water supply perspective, they're located in the Sierras. Are you looking into projects in the Tuolumne River watershed or in partnership with the irrigation ag districts in those areas? Yeah. Um, so yeah, our source watershed for much of our operations is the Tuolumne, based on where we sit in San Francisco, San Bruno, and predominantly east of 101. Uh, even though you know the the cities are our provider and Valley Water is is generally the wholesaler, based on where we are located, we're we're consuming mostly Hetch Hetchy water, and, and then obviously there's the local watershed, the Coyote watershed, that we're seated in. Seated in. Um, so yes, ideally we would be looking for replenish projects that support the watersheds that source our water. So we would be looking for projects in Tuolumne Meadows and up. Mm -hmm. uh, uphill of uh, the O'Shaughnessy Dam, um, those projects are hard to come by. Um, as Peter uh, had, had talked about in his presentation, SFPUC does have a water bank in Don Pedro, and ha they have you know contractual agreements with the irrigation districts. So because of that, it, it allows us to start to look at water projects in those regions downstream of, of Hetch Hetchy and find and fund projects there and feel that it is still uh, and, and make the argument that, that that is still in support of our source watershed. Ideally, we'll be finding those, you know, upwater projects. Uh, and if anybody on this call is aware of them, let, let me know. Um, let Bonneville Environmental Foundation know, who is a, a key partner uh, of ours for finding projects and working uh, closely with all of the QAC members. Um, because that's kind of the holy grail for these types of projects. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's quite an interesting portfolio of projects. Uh, we have last question from uh, Kim O'Kane. Um, is, this is about the uh, managed uh, toilet uh, sensor <laughs> project. Um, is the toilet sensor technology uh, based on sensor industries? And then there's a second question. Uh, um, was there a rebate from the local water agency uh, hmm. for this? I'm, I'm not sure how this spans as far as uh, agency. Um, the first part of that question, I don't know how to answer. I, I, I really just don't know. Um, the second question about rebates, I don't know the answer to that one as well, but I don't believe we tapped into rebates. Um, we just used uh, the private funding from uh, the, the members of QAC. Um, but I would say if you have specific questions about this project, reach out to Cora uh, from Pacific Institute who presented yesterday. Uh, she really was a huge driving force behind this project. Pacific Institute is a a member of QAC, California Water Action Collaborative, and uh, and and uh, like I said, was a big force behind this project. So um, I would suggest reaching out to her. Sorry that I couldn't answer that more directly. Um, no, that uh, well, you're it's good to give a, a put Cora on it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Sorry, Cora. And uh, I, yeah, I think the comp I think it was a question about the company called sensor industries uh, mm -hmm. you know if they were if their technology was used um uh but um uh, i'd have to double check that yeah, i don't, don't want to speak on on this call well anyway thanks uh very much for uh reporting on uh the uh the water stewardship uh strategy and uh um, you know, the plan, I mean, it really sets up, uh, uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's internal and external. And, uh, um, I, 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 you know, kind of love the idea of, you know, looking around and, and having partners for different, uh, um, you know, beneficial projects. Uh, so, um, 
anyway, thanks uh, very much for presenting. And uh, thank, um, thank you, Dennis, and thanks everyone for joining the conversation and being being part of the solutions. We need we need the collective action more than ever. Well, yeah, I mean that's come up a lot of. I mean, you know, just it, just even in the Central Valley context, uh, um, and uh, I, you know, and and again, Eric Rosenblum, you know, just uh, putting that out there, uh, um, you know, the his. Uh, kind of summa summation of that is, uh, I think, really uh, a very astute one. So um, anyway, we'll uh, now uh, take a look with uh, Kim Hackett at, uh, I'll get her going. I'm going to have the recording lady make 